we did many, many decades ago. <laughs> and we went to the University of Virginia together, and there are other UVA people in the audience who graduated from UVA. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Sherry Weston, Elizabeth Weymouth. Um, so Katie and I were both the features editors of the Cavalier Daily, the daily newspaper at UVA, uh, three years apart. And I actually didn't know Katie at UVA. And um, Patty's a little older. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. So Katie, what did you want to do when you were 18 years old? You know, I really didn't know. I know that uh, my dad was a print journalist. He covered politics for the Atlanta Const Constitution and then worked for United Press before it was UPI. It was just United Press in Tallahassee. And um, I always loved to write. And I could write fairly well. And I wrote pretty well under deadline pressure. My dad used to make fun of me because I'd always doing, be doing my homework in front of the front door before the bus came in the morning. <laughs> and so I think very early on, I learned how to work under pressure. And I learned how to, to meet deadlines uh, and with very little time. And I also was sort of always, it's hard to believe, I was always very outgoing um, and, <laughs> and very curious and interested in people. I used to go to my sister's football games when she was a cheerleader and I was younger. My older sister was 10 years older. And I used to go to the game and I'd turn around and I'd say, are you Barbara McLaughlin? And this you know, high school senior would be like, yes, I am. And she'd say, why? And I'd say, I saw your picture in the yearbook. And so I was just always <laughs> extremely friendly. I know she was like, please get this kid away from me. <laughs> but you know, so I think when I thought about a career, I was really interested in advertising because I like I like, I'm fairly, I like to think I'm a little creative, and uh, I thought that would be a really fun profession. But when I was in college, I actually had several interviews at advertising agencies in New York. And I remember it was uh, March day, it was, I was on spring break, and it was pouring rain. My umbrella had gone upside down, and I finally got to my last interview after a series of people saying, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. I had a terrible cold, I had mascara running down my face. And the woman from Gray Advertising said, I'm sorry, you know, you might want to think about going to business school. We don't really have anything for you here. And I, I, I started to cry in the middle of the interview. And she said, maybe you should get a job a little closer to your parents <laughs> in Virginia. <laughs> so the advertising thing didn't work out. But, but then I, but I decided I was going to pursue journalism. And my dad had me work at radio stations in Washington while I was at UVA closer during the summer. Parents. Yeah. But I worked as an intern, I learned, I got to know a lot of people, and then when I graduated, I went to work for ABC News in Washington, and I was really hooked. I loved writing, I loved reporting. Sam Donaldson whisked me off to a White House press briefing, I think my first day on the job. And, uh, but I did look around and I thought, there are not enough women in important positions here. And I realized then and there, that things had to change. And I was talking to Anita Hill, and I was telling her when I got into the business in 1979, harass was two words instead of one, which is a, something <laughs> that, I've, that I've often used. But it always gets a laugh, and that's why I keep dusting it off and pulling it out, you know? <laughs> but, um, you know, it was a very different environment then. But I was really, you know, I loved, I loved the business, and I feel so excited that I still am very excited about telling stories, meeting interesting people, you know, allowing myself to be a conduit for them to tell their stories to the world, to shine a spotlight on important issues that might be avoided or neglected by other media outlets. So, you know, I'm, I'm still incredibly jazzed by what I do. So Katie went from ABC to CNN and then went to NBC in, what was it, 1989 to become yeah, Pentagon right. correspondent at NBC and spent is it 16, 17 years there? Yeah, I remember going on my honeymoon because I had just gotten married to my late husband, Jay, in June, and we went on, on, on our honeymoon to Italy, and I brought all these magazines from Jane's Defense Weekly. And he was like, are you seriously studying all this military hardware? Now, there's a joke there that I am not going to partake in. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, yes, I was very excited to, to cover the Pentagon for NBC, and, and I think, luckily, Tim Russert actually gave me that opportunity because I was a local news reporter in Washington, and NBC and WRC shared the same building on Nebraska Avenue. And Tim liked the way I was 
pursuing Marion Barry at the time, the mayor of Washington, and there was a lot to pursue there, believe me. <laughs> so, um, so he he said, you know, I really, I, you know, he pretty much did the the Lou Grant thing of spunk, you know, you've got spunk, and he actually liked spunk, unlike Lou Grant, and uh, he offered me the job at the Pentagon, and uh, and then it was sort of off to the races because the Today Show was ha was in a bit of turmoil. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they wanted somebody who seemed like a really regular gal, and that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Katie, um, you spent a long, long, you had a long and wonderful run at Today. And, um, you know, after Jay died, I mean, you were even more sort of America's sweetheart. You were I on the cover of People expecting. Magazine. Okay. I mean, come on. Seriously. What, what, you know, is Bob Costas ever called America's sweetheart? <laughs> <laughs> but yes, True. I guess in a way it was a compliment. On the other hand, it's sort of I like perky and cute. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's subversively marginalizing, I think. But th thank you anyway. <laughs> so Katie left NBC <laughs> after a long, long run and very, Poor very Poor Batty, successful. she's like, oh God, okay. No, no, that's <laughs> fine. I, I mean, but I remember that cover and I, you know, I mean, I grew up admiring the great women journalists. I mean, I always wanted to be a, a journalist from the time I was, you know, in high school, really. And so you were just a few years ahead of me, but I looked at you and I was like, <laughs> seriously. So now the truth is out, yes. <laughs> but so Katie, then you went and you were the evening anchor on CBS for a few years. And then you did a talk show on ABC and then you went to Yahoo. So, along that path... I apparently cannot keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what, was, what was a misstep? Surely you had a misstep along the way. What would you have done differently? Well, I, I think probably in retrospect, let me see, I think that probably at CBS, I was brought in to kind of shake things up. And I think in retrospect, I probably should have done that at a much slower pace. I think, you know, I, I've thought about this. It's a very traditional network. I think the most traditional network of the big three. And I think that my edict from Les Moonves was to kind of shake it up, to be less formulaic, to less voice of God. And, you know, I think my strong suit is I'm very relatable and accessible, and I'm not kind of a portentous evening news person, you know? That's just not who I am. And I think that probably it was enough of a shock to the system for CBS viewers to frankly see a woman in that chair, and then to have somebody who was really kind of changing the format and tinkering with it. And I think in that, in that venue, it's really hard to experiment. You know, I think there are some places where you can say, we'll try things, and if they don't work, you know, we'll recalibrate. But I think in a very, a, an older audience that has seen uh, the evening news in a certain, you know, from a certain prism for so long, I think it was, was too much too soon. And I also think I probably should have been a little more political. And I'm just not that political. I'm a very direct person. And what do you mean political? I probably should have played the game a little bit more sucked up to the right people a little bit more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just not my thing, but maybe it should be, <laughs> so. How big a risk was it to go to Yahoo, to leave the broadcast networks? You had tried them all. Yeah, all but <laughs> Fox and New York One. Well, yes, except for Fox and New York One. Um, were you worried at the time about relevance and reach? Well, you know, I mean, I think it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that we're undergoing a massive transformation, not just in media, but really in every aspect of society when it comes to technology. And clearly, I think it's really changed the way people are consuming news and information. And I think, uh, you know, I think television is still incredibly important and some great work is being done in television. But I thought this would be fun and challenging. And I'm really of the school that it's always important to continue to learn, to continue to stretch. You know, I could have played it safe a long time ago and probably would be, you know, walking with a walker into the 30 Rock. And, you know, and, 
and, and yet, I think to, to really have new challenges and to try new things is, is really the way I'm wired. And so, um, you know, there was this whole, whole new world out there. And it's been really an incredible learning process for me. I'm learning, you know, expressions. They speak a whole new, a whole different language. So you know, they say like do? whiteboarding and dashboards and dog fooding. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> iterating? And I'm like, what are you? What, what is the dog hell are you fooding, talking? Katie? That's when they sample uh, tech problem, protect new tech products internally. Oh. And I'm like, what? Who are you people? So, um, <laughs> but but it's really fun for me because I'm. First of all, I get so much creative freedom. I do everything from an 18 minute sort of mini documentary on Harper Lee's new book and go down to Monroeville, Alabama and talk to a historian from Auburn, a professor emeritus who's visited Harper Lee over a hundred times, talk to him and craft, and I'm able to craft a beautiful, you know, doc, little mini documentary to doing an explainer on the Iranian nuclear deal or on Benghazi, which has really been, really resonated these explainer videos with young people. And uh, so I think the, the range of work that I'm able to do, I'm able to talk to Ted Cruz for 45 minutes. That's pretty much unheard of in television. And I, you know, if I think something's important and interesting and needs to be exposed, I'm able to do it. And that's incredible flexibility and really allows me to fulfill myself creatively. So surely you tried to talk to Harper Lee. I did. And I think actually the, the professor I talked to, who was sort of the heart and soul of this interview, um, actually asked on my behalf if she would even just meet me. And she said, hell no. <laughs> so it didn't happen. I really just wanted to meet her and, and uh, not even report on it. And I was supposed to meet her a few years ago, actually, when it was the 50th anniversary of To Kill a Mockingbird, and it didn't happen. But I'm so proud of that piece I did. And I really, I would say that it, it was the best piece visually on Go Set a Watchman, her new novel, anywhere. And, uh, you know, that's really fulfilling for me. Do you find that you have the access at Yahoo that you had? I mean, you want to interview, you know, you want to interview the Pope. Do you, did you, do you have more access with a broadcast network behind you as or do you have as much access with I think Yahoo behind your name as you did at a broadcast I think network? it depends. I think that mostly younger staffers are recognizing how powerful uh, the digital audience is, what a long tail many of these stories have, and how they can be shown and re-shown and rebroadcast and reposted and shared. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think, I mean, I still think we're honestly, Patty, in a transition period. Mm -hmm. And I think broadcast television is obviously still extremely powerful, but I think things are moving in a direction where they're both going to serve each other. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, a lot of people, you know, are very, they find it very appealing that they, when Carly Fiorina comes on, that she can talk for 25 minutes right. and really make her views known on a whole variety of issues versus maybe four minutes on a broadcast platform. Yeah. So, you know, I think it, it really depends, but I'm finding that a lot of people are excited and interested in talking to me. I also think, you know, I've built a reputation for 35 years as being a fair and prepared interviewer. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, fortunately, that counts for something. And there are a lot of people in the digital space don't have necessarily the journalistic background I have. Right, right. So let's talk about tomorrow night, the debate, the election. Um, do you think Joe Biden will enter the race? <laughs> I'm going to say no. Why? I just, uh, I, I was talking to a friend of mine today, and we were saying that it's sort of like buying a boat. You know, the best day is the day you buy it, and the second best day is the day you sell it. <laughs> I think that, you know, the day you announce you're running is probably the best day. I, you know, I have a lot of admiration for the vice president. I've known him for many years. I have so much empathy and sympathy for the personal travails he's endured and uh, the recent loss of his son, Bo, who is a wonderful person I met on a number of occasions. I just am not sure. I mean, I don't know, by the way. I have no idea. A friend of mine told me that he thought we would find out this week, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, but I just, I'm just not sure... He's going to, I'm not sure, as he said to Stephen Colbert, if his 
he's really got the fire in his belly. I mean, I do agree with Kirsten, and I think that it would be good for the Democratic Party to have a lot of different voices heard, but I just am not convinced he's going to make that step. And I have no idea why I'm saying that, so please don't quote me. <laughs> That's off the record. People. Are you? Uh, it is not. Um, <laughs> Are you heading Yahoo's election, election coverage? I'm doing a lot of pieces. You know, we have a lot of great print journalists who are covering the campaign, John Ward and a, a lot of people on the, on the tech side, okay. T-E-X-T. And, uh, but I'm doing a lot of interviews and uh, a lot of political coverage because I love politics. I really have enjoyed covering them in the past. You know, I was at the helm of the 2008 elections for CBS and later for the midterm elections as well. I did some pretty, I think, um, influential political interviews through the years, so. Do you think Hillary's in trouble? Um, I think she, I think, you know, I think it's typical for somebody who is the front runner so far out in the race, and I think she's gonna have some ups and downs. I think that tomorrow night will be a really good night for her because she's incredibly eloquent. She is so well-versed on the issues. And if Carly Fiorina impressed people, I think she's gonna knock people's socks off because she is, I mean, I don't know, I'm sure many people here have seen uh, Secretary Clinton speak and she, you know, she can walk around no notes. She is, it's just so fun to see kind of figure out how is that, you know, going on in here and then coming out there. It's so, yeah, I mean, it, it, she's, she's an incredible communicator and I think that people will, when, once they really get down to policy, as Kirsten said earlier, I think that people will start paying more attention. I think right now it's entertaining. Everything's kind of a sideshow. I think, you know, listen, I think the email scandal has certainly hurt her. Um, but because I think there's something called confirmation bias where it, it, it I think, can sort of fits a, a, a specific narrative that has been perpetrated by a number of people and that some people are concerned about. So I think that that's been a problem. There, there's no question about it. But I think when they really start talking about policy issues, I think she'll be able to rebound. Do you have any theories about how the Republican ticket is going to play out? I don't. You know, I mean, a lot of people are very impressed by Marco Rubio. I don't know. You know, he's got a very compelling personal story. His parents fled Cuba. Um, and, and I think he has, I, I, when I interviewed him, I was very impressed at, he had such a, a very good handle on a whole panoply of issues. Um, and you don't hear many of the candidates talk about specifics yet, but, um, I think he, I think he's one to watch. I think, um, so, so we'll see. I think, Can I Can you think, see a Rubio Fiorina ticket? I don't know. I really don't know. I haven't thought, thought about that okay. yet, but, um. You know, Carly Fiorina was, was offended when I asked her if she was running for vice president. And she said, you, well, Katie, you wouldn't ask a man that question. And I said, I most certainly would. Mm -hmm. So. Interesting. Katie, um, I love to say that real power is what you do beyond your official job title uh, and your platform. It's using your platform to do other things. And you have done that in extraordinary ways. So Katie has a huge public profile. After her husband Jay died, she raised a ton of money. You tell us how much for colon cancer. Uh, she helped start Stand Up for Cancer. She has broadened her philanthropic efforts. Just give us an update on where you are now with all that and what more you're trying to do. Well, as some of you might remember, you saw me very up close and personal on the Today Show with my colonoscopy that I broadcast um, after Jay died. Well, I decided to expand those efforts um, because while I brought a lot of attention to colon cancer screening and colonoscopies and really was so proud to have an impact on the number of people who were being screened, I think the University of Michigan did a study and said that colonoscopies had increased 20% as a result of my efforts, which means a lot of lives saved, and what's better than that, really, you know? And so, you know, I think that that was a, a really powerful way for me to pay tribute to my husband. And, uh, but after a while, I got tired of colons. <laughs> and I was like, you know, there's so many other cancers that deserve 
attention. When you think about, you know, cancer deaths in this country and, you know, so many people, I mean, as we're sitting here enjoying this nice dinner and this really um, scintillating conversation, you know, people are, are losing their loved ones uh, at an extraordinary rate. And so I decided that I wanted to expand and raise money for, for all of cancer research. I thought if, you know, if the country comes together when there's a tsunami or comes together on 9-11 in this profound way, surely we can come together and, 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 and raise money for research for all these scientists. You know, one in 10, only one in 10 promising research grants is funded by the federal government. And that means nine out of 10 great ideas are being left on the proverbial cutting room floor. And I just thought, that's not right. We need to support our cancer researchers and scientists. We need to, to give them the tools they need so they can save lives. And encourage them to collaborate. Yes, so we actually changed the paradigm of how cancer research is done. And rather than competition, we focused on collaboration. And so we have uh, 19 dream teams that we fund. We have, uh, I think so far, $370 million have been pledged to these dream teams to support these scientists. So they're, you know, which is great. And it was started, you know, I mean, talk about the power of women. It was started by nine women who were just totally pissed off at the pace of, of progress being made in cancer research, from Sherry Lansing, who's just an amazing person, to Lisa Paulson, who's here tonight, yep, who is Lisa. head of the Entertainment Industry Foundation. Laura who's Ziskin, just, who was here a few years ago and who passed, passed away. Uh, an um, incredible Hollywood She producer. was on a panel with Elizabeth Edwards yeah. and Carly Fiorina, actually. Wow. Well, you know, Carly cancer, cancer. when you consider that one in two men and one in three women will be diagnosed with cancer in, in their lifetimes, it's something that affects everybody. So. I feel so proud of what we've been able to, to accomplish and what we'll continue to accomplish. We're going to form a colon cancer dream team. We're doing a big benefit in New York this spring to raise money for that dream team. But you have people from MD Anderson, you have people from uh, you know, UCLA, from Genentech. They're all working together and they're sharing their wisdom and their brain power and their tissue samples. And we've made real strides in pancreatic cancer and postmenopausal breast cancer. We're really active in the immunotherapy uh, field. And so it's just been incredibly exciting and profoundly gratifying. So Katie, before we, um, it's so interesting because unless people are like stalking Katie Couric and really following her career, we don't know about this stuff. We were just sitting next to each other at dinner and I didn't even know. I knew about a film called, a documentary called Fed Up, which is about obesity, that Katie had executive produced and <laughs> narrated and started a Kickstarter campaign to raise money to show it in public schools. I did not know about this gun control documentary. And before we wrap up, I just want you to talk about that. And and finally, I'm just going to ask this in one, one <laughs> okay. shot here. What is power to you? Talk about this gun control movie, and let's just close with you telling us what power means to you. OK, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> That's so serious. Um, well, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I find that working in the documentary space is so exciting because Unfortunately, you know, there used to be white papers and there used to be Edward R. Murrow specials on CBS and now networks really don't take substantive issues and examine them and explore them because it's, you know, they won't rate. And so I was very interested in, in understanding obesity because I'd been covering it for 30 years and we'd been talking about it and yet the problem was getting worse and worse. And that's when I did Fed Up, which is I think that was the number one downloaded documentary in 2014. Incredible! I think it, it ha has had incredible impact. Impactful isn't actually a word, just for FYI. And uh, and and it did, and it's now on Netflix. And I think you know, I have people come up to me all the time and say, "I saw your movie. I lost 30 pounds." It's all about sugar and hidden sugar and marketing and really food food manufacturers and how they're really pulling one over on all of us. So after that, really had an impact, and we were literally kind of at a a tipping point, literally and figuratively, I said to Stephanie Sotig, the director of Fed Up, who's incredibly talented, what, what can we tackle next? And I said, I don't understand why nothing, why, why 
nothing, nothing is happening when it comes to sensible gun legislation, especially after Newtown, especially after covering Sandy Hook. And so I said, we need to explain. We just kind of need to explain because people hear these stories in dribs and drabs. And I think Fed Up was so effective because we were able to take 90 minutes and really trace an issue and really explain it to the public. So we have done, I just watched the rough cut because I was in Los Angeles last week. And I think it's going to be Under so, the gun. Well, right now the working title's under, under the gun. I mean, in ways I think it, it should be called Life Interrupted because it's very character driven, including a profile and a very intimate look at uh, Gabby Giffords and Mark Kelly. And I want to thank wow. Gabby for participating. Yeah. Um, Rich, Rich Martinez, whose son was killed in Isla Vista, and we have the fa parents of an adorable girl who was killed in that movie theater in Aurora, and Mark Barden, who I've become actually quite close to from Sandy Hook, whose son Daniel was murdered that day. And through all these character stories, we intersperse it with actual history of what is the NRA and really giving people really solid information so they can have a better understanding of the issue and what's going on. And, um, you know, in many ways, the story of Gabby and Mark is a real love story. And there are so many tender moments between the two of them. I watched this and I just cried and cried because it's just so incredibly moving. And so I feel like power, to answer your question, Patty, is, is having an impact, is using whatever kind of influence you're lucky enough to have. And in my case, I had a built-in bully pulpit and have had for many years. And what do you do with that? You, you educate people. You enlighten people. You inform them. You know, I don't necessarily see myself as an advocate, although since, you know, in this documentary space, I'm free to do things that I couldn't do on network television because of the sponsors, you know? Can you imagine uh, the head of a major soft drink company at the Robin Hood Benefit asked the organizer to please sit me as far away as possible after Fed Up came out? And, you know, a lot of networks would not tolerate that kind of, that kind of work and that kind of journalism because it would be too alienating. So I think power is using your position and, and making a difference. And that's really what I've tried to do during the course of my career. Those are beautiful words to close the evening with. Thank you, Katie Corey. Okay.